Hi there folks, I'm Aaron Tapalian and welcome back to another episode of Game Design Live. For any newcomers, GDL offers you live de design deconstructions of a video game as it's played by, well, me, a game designer. So if you're into game design or into a certain game and want to understand it better on a design level uh, and the consequences of its various design decisions, then this is the place to be. Welcome to the next episode. This is the first and only episode on Death's Door. Uh, we're going to just um, have a little play through it. We're going to call it some observations as we go. I have played this game already um, uh, all the way through to completion. I really enjoyed it. I've got some things I want to call out as we go, but we're going to start a fresh game from scratch and just peel things out as we go and have a look at maybe why the developers did some of the things the way they did them. So let's get started. So for anyone who is not familiar with Death's Door, it's essentially an isometric Zelda-like, classic Zelda-like dungeon crawler where you play as this adorable little crow. Um, I think they're called Reapers? Uh, the premise is that you, as a Reaper, are there to harvest souls for what is essentially a company that harvests souls. Um, and, I mean, from the get-go, it's extremely charming. Um, I think an IGN review recently described it as the perfect blend between somber and charming, which taps into it perfectly well. Tonight as well, we've had a few episodes of uh, GDL so far in games like The Ascent and Returnal. Tonight I'd like to try and place a slightly bigger focus for you guys on digging into why certain design decisions have possibly been made in a game, or in this case, Death's Door. Game design obviously is all about cause and effect. I'm going to pause myself for a second while we play through this. If anyone would like me to like skip through the dialogue or enjoy reading the dialogue, just let me know what your preference is. I'm happy to skip through it or I'm happy to kind of take it a bit slower so you get to read it along with me. Serious. Cool. So yeah, as we were saying, <laughs> game design is all about cause and effect, basically. So where you typically have an effect in mind with regard to the player, like what you want the player to do and how you want them to behave, and um, how you want to try and achieve that effect through causes. That's the design decisions that you make along the way as you design your game. So we're going to be pointing out some of these causes and breaking down what goal or goals the, the developers maybe had in mind for their players as they developed Death Store. So, we talked about razors in the last episode of GDL on the Ascent, part two, uh, where we talked about razors. Razors are a term that's used in the games industry to describe a very quick and easy way of describing a game's idea. And a lot of the time it's, you know, saying something on the lines of, it's this game plus this game, or bits of this game plus bits of that game. Um, and where Death's Door is concerned, it's kind of like Dark Souls meets Zelda. That's sort of the realm that you're looking in. Dark Souls in the sense that you've got a very stitched together world. It's also quite challenging. Um, you die quite frequently. The, the way they do health and rehealing is also quite similar to Dark Souls, which we're going to look at in some detail later on. Um, and then you've got the sort of Zelda aspect, which is the style, the humor, the sort of the personality, the camera perspective, of course, as well as a big part of that. Um, let's just go up here. So yeah. Your core sort of mechanics from the get-go, just to kind of give you a quick sense of what you can do, you can roll, and there's no limitation to roll, unlike in the Ascent, which we talked about last time. You can roll with no kind of limitation, there's no stamina mechanic, there's no limitation on waiting for rolls to recharge, and you can swipe. Look how adorable these little things are. Look at these little cute things that I just frightened away. Oh no. So if I just go back here for a second, there we go. Super cute, right? <laughs> And the little sound, the little sort of squishy sound they make as they follow you as well is just adorable. 
I think there's an achievement for having like 10 of them following you at the same time, which I haven't got. Um, yeah, so you can do that. You can swipe. I'm so sorry. I'm going to scare you guys. I had to do it. You can swipe. Um, we are going to touch on this as well. So the VFX that you see there when you swipe your sword, there's a couple of reasons why developers do this, and especially in what's called an isometric game. So isometric is the camera angle that we're looking at right now, where you've sort of got a top-down view at an angle. That's what's known as isometric. Um, and the reason that developers tend to put in these like effects when you swipe your sword is partly to make it look cooler, obviously, but namely it's to make sure the player understands what the range of their attack is. It's very important in isometric to have that kind of information easily digestible. So in this scenario, we can see just about how far our sword swipes so we can make better informed decisions as we're playing. So there's that as well, as well as rolling. And also you can, oh, I wasn't gonna show that off straight away, but that's kind of cool anyway. You also have a, a charged attack. What's interesting about the charged attack is when you're holding and charging, you are stationary. You can't move. The reason this is done most likely is to create a little bit more anticipation and a little bit of a smarter use with the with the move. If I could move while using this attack, then what reason is there for using this attack really ever? It's weaker um, than the alternative. Therefore, um, if I could move while doing my strong attack, there'd be no reason to, to ever use the alternative. So when I'm using this attack, I really have to be thinking about timing and opportunity. Oh, I, you keep coming back to me, man, and I keep frightening you. Oh, a sec, just gonna fix this here. There we go. You can spam rolling a la Hades. For some reason, guys, my chat isn't working properly. Sorry, I was just trying to check out what the stream was there. That's what that delay was. I was trying to figure out what's going on with my stream on my phone, which I usually rely on um, for seeing what you guys are saying as we chat. Um, I'm going to see if I can fix it at some point, but in the meantime, I've got backup, luckily. Um, yeah, so you can spam rolling a la Hades. You can just roll as much as you want. It's a different style of rolling to Hades in the sense that it's a more physical roll. I'm not sure to what extent they mess around with iframes, but we're going to get a sense of that as we go. So yeah, we can do the charge attack. Um, and last but not least, we can shoot. So we have a bow and arrow here. You press and hold the left trigger and you charge up your bow. Um, and you do nothing? Oh, of course. Uh, sorry. So, <laughs> you press and hold left trigger to arm your bow, and then you pull right trigger. Not right trigger. No, not that either. There we go. B. <laughs> or circle, um, if you're playing on PlayStation, which it might be for. I'm not sure. Uh, circle B to, uh, to shoot your bow. So you'll see there what's quite interesting is that when we fire our bow, there's two sorts of pieces of UI in the top left corner of the screen. There's our health. Health is represented as a very um, simple four chunk system so health isn't health isn't um analog where you know you're losing numbers you're just losing chunks of health so in that sense it's far more similar to zelda again where in zelda of course you lose hearts per hit um and then i'll see uh, you can see below there these sort of diamond shapes this is the ammunition for your bow so as you fire your bow you use up ammunition and to get ammunition back you have to hit objects or enemies in the world which creates what you'd call a synergy between melee and ranged now the first question you might ask is, well, why? Why bother create that synergy between two? Why not just have it that, you know, it recharges or whatever else? The reason for this is because the developers probably had a certain type of combat in mind. They wanted to encourage players to get into the fight without being able to kite constantly. If you want your ammunition back, you have to get up close and personal. And then when you've been up close and personal, you can use your bow more strategically. So it's an ebb and flow between melee and ranged combat, which creates a very distinct kind of experience. Um, so this synergy exists to ensure that the players are doing this. So what's really cool about the very beginning of the game, um, we talked about this a little bit with the second episode on The Ascent, is how the onboarding experience of The Ascent doesn't quite show off its best qualities quick enough. It gets incredible in the sort of like later 20, 25, 30 minutes of the game. Death's Door doesn't make this mistake and you're about to see why. So straight away within the first sort of two minutes of the game, if even that, because I was doing a lot, lot of talking, you're given a boss fight and you're very quickly shown what the game has to offer. Um, Straight away, you'll see, we talked about this before, is attack telegraphing, extremely clear attack telegraphing from the enemy, 
where it's giving you plenty of time to anticipate attacks. It looks scarier than it actually is, which makes you feel, in turn, really cool when you inevitably defeat it. If you couldn't hear that, that was me hiccuping. I apologize. <laughs> I just had the best turkey, brie, and cranberry sandwich. We can all agree that is the best sandwich, can't we? Okay, so we're going to start hitting this guy and see what happens. So straight away we get a nice bit of haptic, but not haptic feedback, visual feedback when we're hitting where the part of the enemy that we're hitting flashes a very clean white owl. That's also a good opportunity to call something out. I'm going to get hit again to show you guys what happened there. When you're hit in Death's Door, they play around with audio. So when you're hit, you'll notice the audio dips to very clearly tell the player you got hit. Watch this. Which is very distinct. Okay, let's see if we can take this down. It is somewhat anxiety inducing. We talked before about the razor of this game being sort of Dark Souls meets Zelda. And Dark Souls is a an aspect of the razor that I'm, I'm using very intentionally. Um, ow, I might actually die in this. That's what I get for talking. Um, and it's interesting as well. For anyone who's interested in finding out more about that sort of subject, specifically difficulty in games and how that impacts player motivation, um, there's an article on my Twitter right now, which is at Um where there's a fantastic article from Gama Sutra on player motivation and difficulty and how the two uh, relate to each other. I haven't read it in great detail yet. Um, I had wanted to for you guys, but it's on my Twitter. If you check it out, at HDPAL, and you can give it a read if and when you have the time. It's definitely worth checking out. All right, let's see if we can get past this and get further into the game, because there's so many other things I want to call out with you. So you'll notice as well that what's happening as I hit this enemy is that it starts to show pink cracks in its body. This is how Death's Door represents health enemy health in the game. There are no enemy health bars whatsoever. Health is entirely represented by these cracks that slowly but surely grow and continue to grow on your opponents um, as they take more damage. So you're not entirely sure exactly how much health they have, which is also in a weird way kind of, as Jimmy Schubert mentioned, quite anxiety inducing, but in a sort of a satisfying way. Like you're not quite sure, but it keeps you very focused on the gameplay. What's also interesting is there's no damage text whatsoever, so you have no idea how much damage you're dealing, nor do you know how much health the enemy has left. So there's no number counting whatsoever. You're totally focused on the task at hand. Bam. For anyone who's uh, a fan of them, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I pick up strong Ghibli vibes from this entire game between the story world, the characters, even the protagonist that you're controlling, these little guys in particular, if anyone can tell me whether you recognize these little guys from in the Ghibli universe, you get 10 points. Don't ask me what the 10 points do, but you get 10 points. Okay, so this is the first world. This is essentially, so Death's Door is divided up into a number of different worlds or biomes. This is essentially the hub world of the game that leads off into, I think the three other biomes that it offers, each of which offers the player a boss to fight against. I doubt we'll make it to a boss during the stream, but we're still gonna talk about them. We're gonna talk about how the game designs its environments around the bosses and how they sort of go about boss design and um, what's quite cool about them. But we can talk about that later. There's plenty of other stuff to look at right now. While we're on the subject, actually, of um, things being anxiety-inducing and difficulty in general, I'd like quite like to talk about just this in general, which is that when you're thinking about difficulty in your game, a lot of the time that comes down to what you reckon your audience is going to be for your game. Um, thinking about the audience of your game is 
very often a very important thing to think about before you even put pen to paper. Who is this game for? I remember when I was back at university and I got asked this question for the first time, I had a bit of a panic attack because I, <laughs> I, I sort of figured I didn't know how to answer that question. Do you mean, did the question mean sort of, you know, a very specific kind of, you know, men and th who are 30 um, or children who are five or whatever? And as I went through uh, my career a little bit more, I'll pause that for a second. So these doors here, so every so often you'll come across these things in the world, which are essentially fast travel points. Let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. So you find these things, you activate them, and these take you back to, um, to your office, essentially. And as you'd imagine, as you play the game more, you add more doors to this place and you can backtrack and get to places you couldn't get to before. There are strong Metroidvania elements throughout the game. But yeah, so circling back around to target audience, um, it's a major question to ask yourself when designing a game is who is the game for? And as I mentioned, the Gamma Sutra article on my Twitter goes into that in more detail. Um, if it's something that you yourself have found yourself thinking about or having to answer, I'd like to say that doesn't, just to try and help along like with maybe some advice that I can impart from what I've learned, when you're thinking about game audience, it doesn't have to be singular. It doesn't have to be sort of a generic answer. It can be, you know, you can answer that question ba based on, you know, well, we want to design this game for players who play this kind of game um, or have this kind of lifestyle. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that, you know, hugely successful games, um, much like hugely successful products in other media, The Simpsons being a, a prime example, tend to cater for very broad audiences um, by offering multiple audiences something for each of them. You know, so there's jokes for the kids, but there's also jokes for the adults that only the adults will get. And games like Mario are a great example of that, right? Because you've got platforming versus platforming well. So kids can just about make it through and have a great time, but for the adults, they can go ahead and platform well, or they can try and hunt down stars that are a little bit more challenging. So it caters for both, plus the visuals are very appealing to a broad range of, uh, of people. So this is something else that we're going to touch on, which are seeds. Um, so on the Twitter earlier where I sort of advertised Game Design Live's episode tonight, we talked about pink cracks being one subject, which we've talked about. We're now going to talk about seeds. So in the game, you'll uh, come across these things, which are seeds. You pick them up. Look at that. We picked up a life seed. So the first instinct is, there we go. Planting one of these in the green pot will yield soul fruit, which can be consumed to restore your health. This is the healing mechanic of the game. So in other words, to heal yourself mid-session, you have to A, explore the environment to find seeds, and then B, you have to find a, a pot plant to plant the seed um, and get some health from it. So in a way, they're kind of like bonfires from Dark Souls. The only difference is that you need the fuel for the bonfire to make it work, which is a really interesting twist. And again, adds to that slight layer of difficulty that, dark, that Death's Door definitely features. What's also interesting is there is no map in Death Store. There's no game map, there's no world map, there's no nothing. So navigating the environment and remembering where you've been and where you've not been is very much down to the player, which again taps into what we talked about, where the game is really trying to make sure the players are focused on the task at hand. It's quite immersion inducing almost. So this is a pot plant that we talked about. So if we plant a seed, we use our seed, and we plant uh, our plant, and we can consume it. We gain health, we had full health anyway, but you can consume it. And these things will replenish themselves after a certain amount of time. So we've used it, we'll come back in like five or 10 minutes or whatever it is, and the health will be there again for us. So you have to use them somewhat strategically. It is also worth saying, just in case you're wondering, that there is a seed for every pot plant. There's actually an achievement for it in the game. So it's not like it's sort of unfair in that sense. There is a seed for every single pot plant, but where you plant them is entirely up to you. I think we can all agree that the music is astounding as well, right? It's almost got kind of like an Ori vibe to it. For anyone who's not played Ori, go check it out. So again, this is something else that Death Store very much encourages exploration. A lot like uh, your sort of classic Zelda games do. They do it through the different pickups that you can find, whether it's seeds or the thing we just picked up there, which is a souls deposit that gives you extra souls. They also do things like... Um, little secret passages and 
hidden corners that you maybe might miss on first glance, but if you keep a keen, a keen eye out for, you'll catch on the first run. So for example, if we head back here for a second, I can maybe show one to you that I think I remember. And once you've found one as well, you tend to feel that sense of FOMO kick in. The fear of missing out, right? Look at this. I think this is one. Nope, that's not one. Let's try here. That's not one either. Okay, so I got it wrong both times. <laughs> Let's try down here. Okay. Well, I've completely misremembered that. So that's my bad. <laughs> but if I find one along the way, like a little secret passage or something. But even those, there are red herrings throughout the game, like areas that look like they could be secrets. And again, create that sense of FOMO in the game where you're just sort of going through every nook and cranny. Oh, wow. Okay, I actually hadn't found that one before. In my second playthrough, guys, I've just found this for the first time and it feels good. Um, but that's a prime example there where the camera actually turns to reveal the secret that it was hiding. It actually intentionally hides things from you in terms of the perspective the camera uses. And then when you find it, it sort of celebrates with that, ah, there it is, and the camera turns. What's also interesting is, again, like Dark Souls, you're not given markers on the map. You're not told what certain special items do. It's up to you as a player to remember the lore that the game tells you about and then go off and find out what that thing is used for. So we just found some sort of special flower, but the game did not tell us in any way, go plant this here or go, go do this thing with it. We ourselves have to keep exploring and finding those things in the game. Okay, this is the first sign that we've come across, and I want to show something really cool. This got pointed out to me in a previous Twitter that I really liked. and. It doesn't add anything to the game, but it's just so full of character and a, such a charming piece of UX. So here we see a, a road sign. If we read the road sign, it says there, this way to the summit. Fantastic. But let's just say that, you know, we hate this sign. I hate this sign. Screw this sign. We chop the sign in half. When we go back to read the sign, we've cut the sign in half. That's what we get. Extremely charming piece of UX. I'd never seen that little trick before. But a lovely touch. And there's little details like that that you tend to find your players will remember. Big details or big things like that, you know, they're also very important, obviously the big subjects and topics in your game. But little details that really make you go, huh, little novel touches like that, especially if there's something you haven't seen before, really stay with you. So here we have sort of a, a fairly basic enemy in the game. Again, very clear attack telegraphing, very wide open opportunities for attack. You'll also notice that enemies are very aggressive. That's very much in line with the sort of personality of the enemies in Death Store. Enemies are very aggressive, usually quite fast, and will get right up and close in your face, which means that a lot of the time you're very much encouraged to stay moving and stay rolling. We're also going to point something else out that's quite cool with the bow and arrow right after I finish with this fight. It's very easy to miss. We talked before in the second episode on the Ascent about the camera shake that they use, the very satisfying camera shake they use to create a sense of heaviness in the weapons that you fire. Death Door does something equally cool, but again, I'm going to have to wait until I finish this fight and there's a chance I won't make it. And then we're having a little touch there. When you win the fight, the entire fight slows down. So yeah, when you fire your bow, you'll notice a little touch that these uh, the developers have done. So let's take the bow out. First and foremost, you'll notice that the camera zooms ever so slightly forward. I say zoom, pans. Ever so slightly forward in the direction that you're facing. So you've got a little bit more range to see the direction you're aiming in. The other thing they do, which is quite cool, is if I pull the, the arrow here, it goes even further still. And then if I let go of the button, I don't know if you caught that, I'm going to do that again. The camera actually sort of rubber bands backwards past the player and then back to the player's original position. Let's check that out one more time. 
You see it that time? One more time for uh, for the cheap seats. One more time. Very cool. So it's essentially emulating the string of the bow through the movement of the camera. As far as camera design goes, it's pretty cool. Let's check up here. Okay, so now we're going to meet one of the really kind of my favorite character in the entire game. How could it not be Steadhorn the Gravedigger? Look at that guy. So yeah, that's another thing that you also get in this game, is that you get a dodge roll attack. I can't say that I used it very often um, during my playthrough, but it is another ability that you get. Just to do that again to show that off to you. So you can roll and then strike. Which just adds another extra layer to the combat. It's one extra tool in the player's arsenal that they can learn to to fight a little bit better with. It just adds another layer of, of mastery, which we talked about in one of the previous episodes on Returnal, uh, when we talked about skill ceilings in games. For anyone who's just tuned in or is watching the VOD, this is Game Design Live. This is the first and only episode on Death's Door. Game Design Live essentially offers live deconstructions of a game's design as it's played live by myself. If you're enjoying the content, please do follow. This is a new channel, so it's hugely appreciated. As well as share the channel or check out my Twitter, which is at AHDepalion, which tends to share an awful lot of gaming-related news and gaming-related articles. It's my job, so I'd like to stay well-informed, but also keep you guys well-informed as well. Cool. I think this is the place. Nope, it's not. It's not the place. Ignore me. <laughs> So as we mentioned before, um, Metroidvania um, influences are very strong in this game. There's a number of times where you'll see areas that it seems to be places you can get to, but you can't quite yet. Um, so you create those sort of mental notes in your head about places you want to go back to, and that's very much the case with this game. You unlock new abilities and new whatnots um, as you progress, which allow you to go back and explore more areas and level up that little bit more. World design is a big part of this as well. Like, if you're looking to build a game or design a game that encourages exploration, it's often very times important to make that world as interesting and as joy joyful to be in as possible. Um, and maybe joyful is the wrong word because different games go about this in different ways. Zelda Breath of the Wild, for example, is an incredible example of creating a, an immersive and interesting world that you just want to explore um, to the point that you, you go off and find lots of different bits and pieces and things. Okay, let's do this. So yeah, this is something else the game encourages you to keep exploring for, which are shrines. Shrines essentially upgrade your max health or your max arrow energy, and you need so many of them before it upgrades you. But again, a little secret that's sort of hidden off the beaten path. But yeah, making a world that feels alive, interesting to be in, these are all important things when you want to make sure that players are wanting... Uh, when you're offering players an opportunity to stick around in your world, to continue exploring it and discovering new things, there needs to be a reason for that. And namely the reason is they enjoy being there in the first place. Who wants to be somewhere they don't enjoy being, right? Speaking of which, I really hope you're enjoying the content. <laughs> In case you're wondering how progression works in Death's Door as well, progression works by killing enemies, earning s or finding these uh, soul lumps, lumps of souls, soul deposits throughout the world, and earning souls. You can see souls there in the bottom right corner of the screen every time I earn some. Um, and then you, uh, whenever you have X amount of souls, you can go back to the office environment, the black and white area um, that we went to before through the door. And there you can spend your souls on various upgrades on various things. Whether it's health or damage or spell 
damage, I think, is another one. Whoa! Oh, you. But let's just talk about death. Um, like in the ascent, death is uh, is not punished essentially, and also its checkpoint system is much better uh, than in the ascent. We talked about this in the second episode of the ascent, where there's no kind of way of telling the player this is where you're going to respawn from. So you you tend to be sort of plonked into random respawn locations that the game just secretly has behind the scenes. In Death's Door, you respawn from the last door you entered. So you know that when you die, you can, or rather, you know when you're in a difficult fight, you can kind of gauge how far back you're going to end up being put. Which again lets you make more informed decisions. Which we like. You'll also notice as well for anyone that um, has followed sort of like previous videos on GDL before that enemies are essentially unflinchable. Unflinchable is maybe the wrong word. They are non-attack interruptible. So a lot of the time, if an enemy is in the middle of an attack and you attack it, the attack will not be cancelled. It will go ahead and do the attack that it was planning on doing in the first place. Which is again along the lines of Dark Souls. In some instances, not in all instances. Okay, let's head back to where we were going before. What's also quite nice is the developers allow you to use the right thumbstick to pan the camera around where you are so you can sort of stretch out and look a little bit further. Um, at the environment around you. Which serves two purposes really. One, just to simply, you know, let you see further, but also it's something else to do as you're running. It's quite nice to have a passive activity the player can, can do while they're doing something mundane, like running from point A to point B, to keep them occupied and again, offer that passive level of interaction with the game. I think this is where the big crow went. Oh, we could have come this way, couldn't we? So we touched on the pink cracks that enemies show when uh, when they're being damaged, and the question might be, well, why? Why do this? Uh, why do it in that way, right? Why not show health bars? If I had to guess, one of the main reasons I would say is that health bars in a game like this, especially for a lot of enemies on the screen, can get quite chaotic. If you can imagine for a second, if you will, you know, looking at this example, imagine seeing these little enemies with like four health bars above them. Like that would be a real kind of like UI clutter on the screen, right? Um, some games do it and it works absolutely fine. But in the case of Death's Door, I think they go to quite a lot of effort to make you feel like you're not necessarily playing a game. It's a lot more immersive than that. Um, they very much kind of encourage the player to focus more on the story world and where they're playing. So to get around that and also avoid UI clutter, they've done what they've done with the health. And it also means, I mean, I, I appreciate that a health bar is literally just above an enemy a lot of the time. So, you know, it's usually never a case of having to, like, look in the corner of a screen or whatever or take your eyes away from the center of the screen where the action's happening. But it does also help with that. Rather than looking a little, at a little bar that's slowly depleting, you're looking at the enemy that you're fighting. You're looking at this nice model that you're fighting. So you're able to appreciate the game that little bit more. Oh, wow. Okay. I think, nope. So here we have another enemy that the game offers you, which shows up quite frequently from this point onwards. This enemy fires projectiles that somewhat track you very softly, I think. Yeah, very, very softly. Um, and when you hit it, it kind of tail spins almost, I guess, which lets you get a couple more hits in and then it vanishes. Wow. 
You'll notice as well that Death Store offers a pretty impressive job on the sound effect design that they use for their bow. There's a very clear sort of charge and ping sound when you're charging your bow, just to reinforce the fact that A, your bow is equipped, and B, your bow is now ready to fire. With one health left as well. Oh, come on, more? Oh. You'll notice as well that enemy just damaged another enemy, which is quite cool, right? That's not always the case, but there are some enemies that do damage other enemies. Oh, jeez, more again. Oh, <laughs> come on. I got so far as well. Fine. Well... I guess we're going back, but this time we're going to take a shortcut. Death Star does offer this a lot of the time as well. Well, their, their level design is incredible, and it's not something I can really break down in the space of uh, 20 more minutes. It's really something you have to experience for yourself. Um, but their level design is just fantastic. And a lot of the time they're, they're quite considerate with their level design. They'll put in shortcuts that you can unlock to, to let you sort of jump back to previous points or future points much quicker so you're not having to traipse back through environments that you've been through already I mean a little bit but not to the same degree okay let's plant this seed that was probably a good idea we should have done that before so what you'll also notice with the encounters in Death's Door uh, we talked about this in the episodes on Returnal um, is that Death Store doesn't suffer from the door problem. This is something that was brought by um, Liz England in a previous article. We've talked about it a few times before, but Death Door doesn't suffer from this issue where you're unable to go through any kind of door and slowly bleed enemies out through it to create an optimal solution. When you're in an arena, you're essentially in that arena. Okay, maximum focus, guys. Let's get through this so I can show you some more stuff. That music. This game was over far too quickly for me. I want the second one. I'm going to risk talking while I do this. If I take one hit of damage, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> so, we talked before about boss design in this game and how uh, the developers go about designing their bosses, but also the biomes that precede the bosses. What I tended to find is that boss designs typically required players to reuse a lot of the knowledge they'd been taught in the biome they'd just experienced to get to the boss, which is a stunning piece of level design in the sense that you feel smart as a player. You're slowly mastering new skills or mechanics, and then at the end, you're given this sort of test to showcase just how good you are which in terms of mastery and learning curves is any part of a game should usually involve some sort of progression, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. Intrinsic being that you're just getting better and can feel yourself and see yourself getting better, or extrinsic in the sense that you're being offered game rewards that indicate you are getting better, whether it's a, a medal or points or a new weapon or whatever, more health. Without progression, players tend to get bored quite quickly. Nice. Without any damage. Okay, this is where I wanted to get to, I think.
Okay, you ready for this? So this is the first proper boss that the game presents you with. Ow. So we've talked before about attack telegraphing in games, um, Returnal being a fantastic example of that. Bosses tend to offer very clear attack telegraphing, enemies in general do, but bosses in particular, where they use even 2D UI to indicate where their attacks are going to land and when their attacks are going to land. And the reason that games do this as well, it depends obviously on the genre of the game and the design of the game and who the game is intended for in terms of target audience but a lot of the time this is there's an emphasis is put on this to make sure the game feels what's called fair i mean obviously you've all heard the word fair before but fair in the sense that you know you probably played the game before and thought to yourself when you took damage or you died that wasn't fair um and the last thing you want as a game developer or game designer is to make a player feel like something ha that happened to them was the game's fault rather than their fault No one likes feeling cheated. Oh boy, wow. Oh, down to one health again. Oh boy. Die already, <laughs> come on. This is what we were talking about though, with not quite knowing how much health a boss has left, it creates an incredible sense of tension in the game. Where you're never quite able to relax, or you're never quite able to um, to make any assumptions. Only guesstimations. And as we can see, the boss fight has slowly but surely got harder and harder with super attacks being combined, um, what's typically known as phases in a boss fight. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I promise I did my best. This time. We'll get it this time. But this boss perfectly represents what we've been talking about, right? Where biomes or environments of the game teach you skills and then the boss essentially offers a test at the end to put all those skills that you've been taught in that environment that precedes it to use. Okay, we've got this. There may have been a shortcut that I unlocked and I've completely forgotten about, but it's okay. Something else I'd like to touch on actually before we go back to that boss fight. So let's just press the back button for a second. Or is it start? It's start. This is the inventory of the game, which is very straightforward. And I'm sure you can all agree is extremely Zelda-like. Um, where you have slots for different items. You have some very basic UI. And then here you have your weapon slots. We talked about this a little bit in the second episode on the Ascent. Um, comparing the Ascent to Diablo and the way that Diablo offers up players... A fair amount of transparency over the progression they're offering players later on in the game. And the reason that games do this a lot of the time is to create a sense of exactly that anticipation. Um, you give players a sense of what they're missing out on or what is to be found later on in the game. And then that creates a, a more of a motivation to keep playing because you want to get that stuff. Um, and in this scenario, Death Door does exactly that. They clear you quite tell, they tell you quite, <laughs> they tell you quite clearly um, there are more weapons in the game um, that are waiting to be found. Um, I was also asked recently, you know, about the fact that it, maybe it felt straight. I was asked basically how often I use the sword versus the other weapons. And to be tr truth be told, I did use the sword by and large for the most part of the game. 
Um, but as part of that question, I was also asked, well, why bother giving other weapons? And the reason is because a lot of the time when, you come to, when it comes to giving players other weapons in the game, it's to offer new mechanics, um, chase prizes, primary prizes. Even if they don't use them, it's something very shiny and exciting to potentially go off and find. It's just another aspect of progression. Okay, this time round. That's the only hit this guy's getting in. That bow feels so good to use. You'll notice as well the boss design is quite clever. When it's firing its laser, you'll see that it's spewing steam from the bottom of it. The reason it's doing this is to make sure that players can't just go up and smack it while it's in the middle of doing something quite so powerful, but also potentially making it vulnerable. Um, so the boss quite cleverly features a little bit of a deterrent to make sure players can't get some free hits in. It's very much a moment of dodge this attack. Which is basically the developer is very clearly telling the player, this is what we want you to be doing right now. So cause and effect. Oh no. What's also interesting about Death Door is that in Death Door, merely touching enemies physically does not cause damage. You've seen this in more retro games, the games like Mario, for example, or early versions of Mario, even recent versions of Mario. When you touch an enemy, just touching it alone, running into it, causes you to take damage. In Death Door, that's not the case. And if we were to pick that decision apart, we could maybe guess that the reason for this is because the developers want the player to be rolling around and moving constantly. If there's a potential chance that rolling around constantly and moving and, and things like that are going to result in taking damage, players likely wouldn't do it as often. So to make sure that behavior is encouraged, um, again, certain causes are put into place to achieve the desired effect. No! Oh, okay. That wasn't me panicking or anything. I'm cool. I've got this. There we go. What's also quite a nice touch about Death Door is the fact that they often give you little things to hit and break throughout the environment, and simply by interacting with them, you gain arrow ammunition back. So there's a reason for, a game reason for uh, hitting things, which in and of itself is fun anyway. check over here and I think this is gonna wrap us up quite nicely if I remember rightly
They said the thing in the thing. So this has been the first and only episode in Death's Door. We've covered quite a lot in the uh, in the hour that we've had. If you've enjoyed the content, then please do follow the channel. Is it a new channel? Um, I'm looking to bring more games to you in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm going to double check my schedule for the next game while you guys are reading through this. So like we said before, this hub world spreads off to three different distinct worlds, each of which offer very different biomes with very different challenges and new mechanics to offer. And what's especially nice is that it places the premise of the game on the player's lap. Really from the get-go, within the first sort of five, ten minutes, you're given a sense of what your role is in this world and what your primary goal is. So it's nice and clear. And I think that wraps us up there, guys. Thank you very much again for coming along to GDL to listen to me talk about Death's Door. The next episode, which is going to be this Wednesday from 9 till 10 B, uh, p.m. BST, is going to be on Hades. We're going to be looking at Hades in depth and deconstructing a lot of what Hades does and why it does it. Again, if you've enjoyed the content, please do follow, please do share. Um, and until next time, thank you very much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>